This is a week of big deals, and you're here. So I want to tell you, you're, by being in here, you're saying that this subject is a very big deal. And I, I appreciate that, and I will be going back, not just to the US, but to Harvard, and I'm going to be saying that you were here. Many, many thanks. Now today, um, you're considering how to take this giant step forward and look at the leadership in this room. So congratulations on the six governments who were the core of putting this together. But each one of you has expanded the number of people and countries that are involved. And today, you're going to get the language right. And you know, if you've worked at the UN, that language is language. Words are words, right? And the same is true at the State Department, actually. Uh, and so you have to figure out how you go beyond the words on paper. And so today, what I'm told by your government, Mr. Minister, is you're not going to leave. You're going to lock the doors until you've got some concrete actions. All right? OK. okay. Good idea. OK, good idea. <laughs> OK. Now, you're going to create a network today, and you've already started. So let me tell you, I teach at Harvard many things, but one of them is about coalition. And so I asked my students recently, they're all graduate students, and they have a lot of experience. They're, they've been parliamentarians, they've bureaucrats, civil society leaders. And I asked them recently, OK, what are the reasons not to have a coalition? And I thought that they would come up with like two or three. And instead, I had to stop them when they got to 10 or 12, because you know, they have, they've seen a lot. And there are a lot of reasons not to have this network. So I want to discourage you a little bit, if I may, and say that when you put together a network, you've got people with very different leadership styles. They don't understand that. And everyone has, not everyone, but many hidden agendas that you've got to try to figure out, slower to come to consensus, the more countries that get into this, and, and just personal jealousies in terms of careers, et cetera. And you move so slowly if you're together. You move really slowly, and there's all this attention to process, and, and the substance suffers. Now, the good news for you today is that there are more reasons to do it than there are to not. And when you get together, as you know, you get the variety of perspectives. You get a broader knowledge base, actually. You're coming in with very different experiences. You get more buy-in from other countries if they're together from the start. Uh, each one of you has stakeholders. You have this fan of stakeholders who are advocates that you're going to bring into this. Another really important piece, though, of putting together a network is accountability. It's so different to say you're going to do something in the abstract versus having to, to be accountable to the other people around the table. And then the, another one is I've been a funder for many years. Funders love cooperation. They just love it. And so when you say, you know, I'm Sweden and I want to do something, it's very different from saying I'm Sweden and I'm part of Chile and Namibia, et cetera, and we are a network. So you're much more likely to get funding from inside this building as well as from outside. So good for you for being determined to work together. I think it's a great choice. Uh, the, the next, in, in a different subject, I get asked a lot a question that you all get asked as well, which is, so how do we know it really makes a difference if women are in a balance with men in terms of leadership? And so I want to I want to question the premise, actually, of the question. And I'll give an example. How do we know if it makes a difference on any subject if Global South is in the room with Global North? Like, who's measuring that? What are the statistics? Well, you know what? That's not where we start. We start with values. And we start with respect. And we say that one country is not more important than another country. That's why we're going to have Global South and Global North. And we also believe it from our own life experiences, that having diverse people in decision making means you get better decisions. So. 
I want us to be really, really careful when people say, well, what's the research on this? Prove it to me that it makes a difference, that you don't just get in there and try to start proving it. And, but you pull back and you say, wait a minute, there's some things you don't have to prove with research because we have basic values. However, all of that said, we do have the research. So that's the good news. And the research is both qualitative and it's quantitative. So let me give you a couple of examples of the qualitative. My friend, Stella Sabiti, she was a student. She was pregnant at the university. She was being tortured, OK? She was on the floor. The soldiers were standing above her. They were kicking her with a lot of others. They were kicking her. They were hitting her with the butts of their rifles. And she said, I'm going to die. And instead of shielding her face, which is the natural uh, tendency to protect your eyes, she didn't. And she looked into the eyes of the soldier who was stomping on her. And she said, she saw a young man. She saw a, a grown boy, right? That's what she saw. And she said, what did your wife fix for you for dinner? And he was furious. He started yelling at you, you leave my wife out of this. And she said, what did your wife fix for you for dinner? And she kept saying it over and over. And finally, the soldier stopped. And the other soldiers heard the same thing, and they stopped. And someone blew a whistle, and the soldiers pulled back out. Now, she said, I learned something really important from that. There was a lesson. And I used it as I was a mediator all over Africa, that you've got to think of the person, not just the action. And she said, when I was later doing a mediation, and I was sitting in this room, and in come the parties, the different parties, that rebel group was one of them. And I recognized one of the soldiers who'd been beating me. And she said, I never told him. I never told them that I was one of those students. So that's an example to me of a tendency that women have, which is very relational, which is very much to, if you're being beaten, she sees a boy instead of just the torturer. So I'll take it to you all in the room. You are our people in authority. So you're not being tortured, but you are people in authority, and you're Good friend, UN Special Envoy, Stefan de Mistura, is pulling together the parties in Geneva. He was not happy with how many women there were in the different parties to the negotiations. So he created, he, he broke the rules. He created a special all women's task force. He just designed it himself. He got a couple of your countries to pay for the, uh, the offices, because he said these women, they don't have no, they don't have an embassy. They don't have offices set up. And why did he do that? He said, they will report directly to me. Why did he do that? He did it for three reasons. First, he said, they are highly invested in this piece. And he knew that when our organization had put together a training, a leadership training, strategic planning, we've worked with 43 countries, by the way out of the 63 or so that have national action plans. So when these women were coming to our training, they literally were crossing mountains. They literally were sleeping in minefields. They literally arrived barefoot, some of them. And you don't get that kind of investment very often. And he said, the other piece of it is they knew what was going on on the ground. And it's very hard to get people who are in the negotiations who, in fact, have done negotiations back at home with ISIS to get the humanitarian aid in, to get the schools open. So they really could tell him, here's what's happening. And third, he said, look, these are tomorrow's leaders of Syria. So that's who you are. That's the opportunities. It's the kind of opportunities that you in this room have. Now, the good news is that's the qualitative. There is quantitative research that says you have to have women if you want success. Because as you know, between 30 and 40% of the peace agreements end up failing within five years. But if you have, and we have this research now, if you have women significantly involved, 
there's a 35% chance that, a greater chance, 35%, that those peace agreements are going to last at least 15 years. That is huge. So we have the research for you on that. You can look at inclusive security, go online if you don't know where to find it. But anyway, I, I wanna end by saying that coalitions are hard. Lots of reasons not to do this today. But all, and all of those problems, all of those reasons not to do it, they're all true. But the benefits outweigh them. And when you go home and your adrenaline has dropped and you're facing all kinds of opposition and your governments are saying, wait a minute, every dollar we have is already spent in some way, you're going to be facing a lot of opposition. It feels good now in a group, but it's not gonna feel good when you go home. So here's what I want you to remember at that point. I want you to remember when your great-grandson or your great-great-granddaughter says, hey, back in the early 2000s, we had malnutrition, we had an environmental crisis, Syria, I've heard that Syria was being bombed to slitherings, we say, there were refugees all over the world. Where were you, granddad? Where were you, grandma? My kids call me Grand Swan. Okay. Where were you? How could you let this happen? And you are not going to have to say, well, I don't know, I, I didn't focus on, on getting women into the decision making to get more balance. I mean, I didn't see how all of this fit together. I, I didn't think there was anything we could do. You're not gonna have to say that because you're going to be able to say, when they say, where were you? You're going to be able to say, well, I understood that we didn't have enough chairs at the table. I understood, and I was one of those people at the UN conference room four, September 23rd, 2016, as we created the network of focal points to change the balance of women and men as decisions are made all over the world. And they're gonna say, where were you? And I'm going to say, you know where I was? I was making a difference. So you're on the side of the angels today, and I am so honored to be with you.